Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. It's always amazing how we often ignore the big picture while we become obsessed with the minutia or with personalities. For example, while everyone is busy opining on the unknown and probably minor impact of a change of ownership of Twitter, we have literally ignored the chilling and perhaps long-term impact that the pandemic has had in enhancing government misinformation and curtailing free speech, all while giving more powers to government and while censoring information that actually might have helped people. And not just in China, but here in the U.S. and around the world. My guest Joel Simon writes in his new book, Infodemic, that throughout the pandemic, many people felt as if they were drowning in information, yet in fact, they were being censored. It was Churchill who originally said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Certainly governments of the world did not. In China, Israel, Brazil, Egypt, India, and in the U.S., COVID-19 gave leaders carte blanche to engage in misinformation, misdirection, and take political advantage. We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Joel Simon. Joel is a fellow at the Toes Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia's Journalism School. He's formerly the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. He has worked as a journalist in Latin America and California and is the author of three previous books. His latest is The Infodemic, How Censorship and Lies Made the World Sicker and Less Free. It is my pleasure to welcome Joel Simon back to this program. Joel, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. Well, it's great to have you here. This idea that government somehow took advantage of the pandemic, used it to acquire more power, used it to to engage in misinformation. The interesting thing about this is that for a long time, it's been kind of a right-wing trope that we have heard repeatedly. But in fact, as you write about in the infodemic, there's a lot more to it. Talk about that in general first. Governments, particularly repressive governments, are highly opportunistic. And every government recognizes that power depends on its, its, the ability to control and manage information. So there's a, there's, a, there's a natural tension. And when I was at the Committee to Protect Journalists, my co-author and I, Rob Marney, you know, we saw crisis after crisis around the world from the war on terror to the Arab Spring, in which governments um, determined that independent information represented a threat and opportunistically cracked down on journalists and imposed censorship uh, using some pretext as the basis for this, whether protecting the population from uh, instability or, uh, or terrorism or what have you. But we had never seen anything like what occurred during the, out, the onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Virtually every country around the world cracked down simultaneously on information beginning in China, but spreading from China to the autocratic world and even the democratic world. Why did governments do this? They did this for a variety of reasons. One, because they themselves were confused. They didn't know how to respond and were, were overwhelmed and uh, thought that the best strategy was simply to ignore the disease or suppress information uh, about it. Secondly, they began to understand that you know the measures they would need to take would have significant economic consequences, and they didn't want to take those measures. So they, they lied, and they, they covered up the seriousness and gravity uh, of the situation. And the third thing was they saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity under the guise of protecting public health to extend their own power, to impose restrictions on, quote, unquote, fake news or public assembly or certain kinds of dissent. And so we saw around the world um, a wave of censorship and a, an assault on rights, which most people, as you, as you said, Jeff, didn't pay attention to because we were understandably uh, consumed uh, and terrified by this, this global pandemic. But now as we enter a new phase, uh, we look around the world and we see a world in which autocratic regimes uh, feel uh, empowered and emboldened. Democracies seem divided. And uh, information and rights uh, have been eroded. So I think we have to recognize this was a 
uh, certainly a public health crisis, but it was also a crisis in the information system. When we look at it here in the U.S., what are the similarities to the way we reacted to the war on terror, to the attacks on 9-11, and things like the Patriot Act? Is there a fair analogy there? Well, I think, I think there are some analogies, but I actually think it's fundamentally different because we had a different kind of president. And instead of trying to rally the country behind a kind of unified response, which is, you know, as misguided as that may have been, in, in, for example, in the aftermath of 9-11, that was certainly the intent. Uh, Trump's intent was rather to deny and cover up um, the gravity of the public health threat, while also, you know, and, and, and his strategy for doing that was not to, to, to unite the country, but to divide it and to do so by using a strategy which we call censorship through noise. It's sometimes called flooding. And basically it has the same impact of traditional censorship, which is to strengthen the government narrative because people are so awash in lies and misinformation. They're so confused. They don't know what to believe. Uh, that they basically, you know, shut down. And the noisiest voice, the loudest voice, uh, often becomes the dominant narrative. And that's how censorship through noise works. And that was a strategy that Trump uh, employed very effectively, not him alone, many other uh, elected populists uh, around the world. Uh, but I think it had a, a, you know, a profound impact on this country, including uh, our response uh, to the pandemic itself. How much of it came out of, and, and were politicians able to exploit it out of the fact that in the early stages in particular, there was so much fear and that nobody really knew anything, that there was so much uncertainty? So the WHO, which you know, has its uh, deficiencies and, and flaws, but they put out this guide to government um, several years before the... Uh, uh, the, you know, COVID-19 emerged about how to communicate during a pandemic. And it's actually very well done and, uh, and, and, and very um, uh, useful to consider in this context. First of all, the conclusion of the WHO was that at the initial phases of a pandemic, when people don't understand the vectors of the disease, the nature of the treatments, uh, really they, there's going to be confusion um, the only tool that governments have at their disposal to combat it is communication. And the ability to communicate is, is enhanced by trust. So you need, you need to have trust and you need to, you need to uh, have political leaders who are able to build a consensus and use persuasion, to, you know, grounded in trust to get people to change um, their behaviors in ways um, that protect public health. So this is the tool that governments have at their disposal, but they completely squandered it um, because they were afraid. And one of the other things that the WHO says about how to communicate at the outset of a pandemic is to acknowledge what you don't know. This builds trust. So it's very important that governments say, we know this, we don't know this, because we don't know, we're asking people to do X, Y, Z. Obviously, autocratic governments around the world didn't have trust. They, they used, um, uh, you know, compulsory uh, measures. But uh, in democratic countries around the world, the ability to act to make trust actionable was completely squandered. As we look around the world, certainly the, the authoritarian governments took advantage of this, as you've, you've talked about. What were the countries, if any, that really got it right? So I'm not, you know, I don't claim to be a public health expert. So rather than sort of comment on what were the right strategies, uh, I think what I would say is what are the countries around the world that were able to use the, you know, the democratic uh, institutions and the media and, you know, other, uh, again, institutions that kind of, mediate the public conversation to arrive at a consensus that was widely accepted on how to respond to the pandemic. 
And countries took different measures that, you know, countries which had some effectiveness. You know, they ranged from, you know, Australia and New Zealand, which basically isolated and restricted all travel. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was effective for a very, um, um, uh, for a period of time. And it had widespread support. Uh, from the um, uh, from the from the populations in those countries, um, and and there was a kind of debate about whether this was was the best approach. I don't think it would have worked in the United States because it was too uh, severe, and we have a kind of libertarian streak in our uh, sort of uh, politics that that might have made it difficult. But it was interesting that it was affected there. Um, you know, South Korea used. Um, you know, very aggressive and effective surveillance strategies. And again, they got, had, you know, the government there had the support, uh, not from everybody, but from a significant segment of the population. Japan, uh, also people embraced mask wearing, which seemed to be an effect. Again, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't comment on which of these strategies are most effective. But the most important thing, again, the governments have the tool that they have at the early stage of, of the pandemic is to communicate and to build consensus and to persuade people about the best and most appropriate way to respond. And those are some countries that I think uh, did a pretty effective job of that. Were there situations, whether it was countries or even among, you know, the differences in state response here in the U.S., where governors and or the federal government in certain cases acquired power, used power in ways that might be considered to be usurping, but that actually may have done some good in the process? Well, the thing that was so important about the pandemic, as we as we describe it in the book, is it, it was a global phenomenon. Obviously, that's a definition of pandemic is a global phenomenon. But it played out in, you know, on, a, on a very local basis, right? So your experience with the pandemic depended a great deal on what community you were a part of. And the information that people needed to access, you know, whether it was about, you know, what is the mask mandate? Are schools open? Where can I get tested? Uh, what are the latest uh, treatments? Those were very local kinds of questions. And, you know, one of the things we looked at in the book, certainly in this country, but also globally, was the role that um, local media played in kind of building uh, consensus around the appropriate action, providing necessary health information to the population, and also holding uh, leaders accountable uh, for the actions that they took um, to protect public health. So, I mean, I can't, rather than answer that specifically, I think the important thing, this is anecdotal, but there's some um, research to back this up, and I think it is very interesting. Communities that had um, strong local media, uh, and as you know, there's you know because of the the, the the challenges with the sort of financial model for news for, for local newspapers um, in, in the United States and in other parts of the world, there's been this this emergence of news deserts. So there are many places in this country and around the world that basically have low local no local news. But there seemed to be a correspondence with better health outcomes in uh, communities that had local news. And I think that is, that is absolutely vitally important and a, real, a really um, a, a essential lesson that came out of our experience with the pandemic. One of the other things you talk about is censorship and, and voices that really were shut down. Talk about that. So rather than talk about that uh, in, in, in the United States, let me let me give you the example from Brazil. So one of the things I did in, in the book was I, I interviewed uh, the health minister, uh, the former health minister in uh, Brazil, uh, Luis Enrique Mendetta. So some people have called him the Fauci of Brazil, and I think that's a pretty apt uh, description. So he was a health minister. You know, he had a lot of experience. Uh, uh, dealing with public health issues when really, the pandemic emerged, uh, but he his his president uh, Jair Bolsonaro was a was a COVID denier who uh, refused to take the public health threat seriously and engaged in the kind of strategy that I just mentioned the the you know the information uh, the censorship through noise where he's just spewing out nonsense and lies to confuse and mislead people and kind of cripple uh, the health, public health response. 
And he told me that there was this meeting between Trump and Bolsonaro. You may recall it at Mar-a-Lago. It took place in early March. And that when uh, Bolsonaro came back from that meeting, it appeared to him that he and Trump had adopted a similar strategy, which was to hype hydroxychloroquine as a miracle cure to blame China for the pandemic, to deny that, uh, you know, uh, sort of dra drastic health um, measures were necessary and to push all decision making down to the local level so that if there was a positive outcome, uh, they could take credit. And if there was a negative outcome, they could blame uh, local officials. And that seemed to be um, uh, the playbook. Uh, in the United States, and it was uh, disastrous here, but it was even more disastrous in Brazil, where it undermined uh, that country's very uh, fragile democracy. And Brazil is um, uh, going through a very um, uh, contentious election right now. And uh, we don't know the outcome of that, but I think one, one, one thing that's clear is that that kind of irresponsible uh, response to the pandemic itself um, caused, caused very grave damage uh, to, the, to Brazil's democracy. It is interesting because looking at the response in, in authoritarian governments, it was to form. They were things that you would expect authoritarian governments to do and abuses that you would expect. The long-term damage seems to be more in democratic governments. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that, you know, that one of the things that we looked at in the book is the, the long-term trend, which is that authoritarian, it's a long-term trend sometimes called the democratic recession. Um, but basically, you know, over the last 15 to 20 years, according to data that's been collected by Freedom House and other groups, you know, uh, the past, author, there have been more and more states that have made a transition from democracy to um, more authoritarian kinds of systems. And what we're also seeing is, you know, take the case of China, for example, okay? China is definitely an authoritarian state, you know, with, 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 with considerable limits on uh, personal freedoms as they relate to, you know, political activity, They're, you know, kind of more personal freedoms. There's certainly a, a zone of tolerance uh, for that. But, um, you know, China became even more authoritarian uh, during the pandemic, and uh, even more brutal in its strategies of, uh, of, of managing uh, a, a kind of arrested population. For example, um, you know, China has used um, surveillance and facial recognition technology like no other country in the world, and those were expanded dramatically during the pandemic as a uh, necessary means to protect public health. And um, China, uh, in China, uh, basically the whole population has to download a, an app that um, is, is a kind of pass that you use to access any public uh, facility and it tracks uh, your movement. If you're COVID positive, you, 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 know, you don't have to be quarantined and you can't leave. And, uh, and the government is monitoring everywhere you go, and this has been deployed uh, nationally. And they've asserted new authorities, like the ability to lock down an entire city of 25 million people in Shanghai, lock people in their homes, even though they don't have enough to eat. So authoritarian countries, many of them have become more authoritarian. Uh, d democracies, um, uh, some of them certainly have been weakened, and some countries have made the transition from, uh, according to Freedom House, from free, like India, to partly free uh, because of the kinds of restrictions that they instituted as public health measures, which were really uh, strategies that governments used to consolidate power. It is interesting to see some of these authoritarian states, and particularly some of these authoritarian rulers, to your point, almost had more to fear in terms of, of being, either being overthrown or weakening their governments than democratic governments did. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you know, the one thing about authoritarian uh, leaders is they're not generally known for their consistency. So, uh, you know, with the exception of China, which basically said, okay, you know, first it denied it. The first impulse of China was to um, suppress information about this new disease, and we document this um, very courageous uh, blogger and sort of information activist, uh, lawyer turned information activist called uh, Chen uh, Qixi, 
who went to Wuhan and tried to record, you know, what was happening there and share it on videos, uh, on YouTube videos, and you know, got a certain amount of attention and, and visibility until the Chinese government, you know, arrested him and other independent bloggers, and then you know, crack down on any independent information and impose uh, their own narrative. But you know, China had the capacity once they decided to take that this was a serious public health threat and to take. Uh, measures to contain the disease to actually carry out some effective actions that did uh, unquestionably limit the spread of the disease uh, in China uh, until now. But other authoritarian countries that we look at, you know, and they're, they're, they range in terms of their political systems and, and sort of uh, underlying ideology from, you know, Russia to Iran to Egypt to Nicaragua, you know, were basically schizophrenic. You know, one week they would say, oh, this is nothing, uh, you know, we don't need to take any action, the government has things well in hand, and anyone who, you know, a doctor or journalist who said else, uh, otherwise was, you know, subjected to some kind of um, repressive action. And then the next week they would say, oh, this is such a serious threat to public health that we have to impose sweeping um, restrictions on assembly and speech um, and other kinds of uh, essential rights that, um you know, uh, uh, you know, allow the ability, allow, you know, enable people to participate in um, uh, in holding authorities accountable. So, you know, Russia was a, was a real example of this. You know, Putin was totally schizophrenic. He would, you know, if if you wanted to hold a protest, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you were, uh, you know, Navalny or his supporters, and you wanted to hold a protest against Putin, that would be um, banned because of health, public health concerns. But if you wanted to hold a rally to support Putin and his, his referendum on extending his uh, term uh, in May 2020, well, then suddenly public health restrictions were lifted and, uh, you know, you were free to do so. Talk a little bit about what went on in the U.S., particularly with respect to both censorship and misinformation, the battles that took place over the discussion of of where the virus came from, some of the misinformation about treatments, et cetera. Well, it's it's a huge it's a huge sprawling issue. But let me let me talk about, you know, the way uh, what I saw within the Trump White House that was absolutely fascinating. So I talked to this um, a senior aide in the Trump uh, White House. Uh, her name was uh, Olivia Troy, and uh, she was the home se- Homeland Security advisor to Mike Pence. And you'll recall that at a certain point when uh, Trump um, uh, was facing considerable criticism because of his failure to uh, acknowledge the gravity of the disease and to continuously underplay it, you know, he created this task force in the White House and he needed somebody with some credibility who had... Um, something of a reputation for being a grown-up to lead that. And so he chose Mike Pence, and this aide, Olivia Troy, became a kind of key point person in the, in the nation's pandemic response and attended you know, many of the meetings of the task force and then engaged with uh, senior officials in the, in the White House who were trying to formulate a response. And, and basically what she told me, she, she became so, um, uh, you know, dis, dis, uh, disaffected um, that she eventually resigned and became, you know, a very vocal and outspoken critic of the Trump administration because she told me the, the, the lies and misinformation that we in the public saw that confused us and so, you know, made a lot of people just throw up their hands and, or take action that may have even been harmful to their, to their own health, you know, they saw it within the White House. So Peter Navarro, who was a, you know, a top uh, Trump aide who was, uh, you know, uh, known for, um, you know, having, uh, you know, being disruptive and also for having Trump's ear, you know, would come into this meeting, you know, with all sorts of, you know, wild claims, including, you know, about, um, you know, that this was some bioengineered um, concoction that the Chinese had um, cooked up and, and, and that's where the disease came from, which was, you know, wild nonsense. I mean, it was a, it was a debate uh, about, you know, whether it was caused by a lab leak or uh, naturally occurring, but nobody who was serious was alleging uh, that it was some sort of um, engineered virus. Uh, but that was raised seriously with the White House. 
And the, um, the impact of that was the same impact that it had on the broader society was just to cripple any sort of meaningful discussion and collective response. So the infodemic you know, played out within the broader society, but it also played out in the senior decision-making circles of the Trump White House. Finally, what is your sense of how long we're going to be dealing with the repercussions of this in terms of, of these issues that we've been talking about? Well, the, 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 the infodemic, if you will, the kind of, um, um, you, know, dis, you know, the kind of broader dysfunction that exists within our information ecosystem, both, you know, on a local level, on a national level, and, of course, on a global level, you know, that's not new. Um, you know, and there are some many, there's enormous benefits that have come through um, the, the sort of technological revolution, which has transformed the way that people access information. And those are well known and nobody is, is, is seriously proposing that we, you know, uh, uh, turn back the clock. But, you know, I don't think anyone's really satisfied with the system that we have now either. And we saw just how damaging and destructive it is to have an information system that doesn't work when it was stress tested by a pandemic and, and, and it failed. So these are long-term trends. And if I could point to a single challenge or a single strategy for addressing that, then I don't claim to addressing it. And I don't claim it's simple by any means, but you know, people consume information, not as rational actors, but as, as part of a community. And if communities are divided and polarized, then the information they consume will reflect that. And you can't address that by tweaking an algorithm or, you know, through better content moderation. You have to create a kind of political consensus. That's something that political leaders do. And in this country and in so many countries around the world, uh, we have a dearth of political leadership. We have political leaders who have failed to take that responsibility seriously. And until that happens, until we demand that it happens, uh, the infodemic is going to continue. Joel Simon, he's the co-author of The Infodemic, How Censorship and Lies Made the World Sicker and Less Free. Joel, it's always a pleasure. I thank you so much for spending time with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you.